Wow, thank you. It was wonderful. Uh, we're going to sing some more later on in the service. Uh, sometimes it's good to break the routine a bit and give us uh, something to sing about, which is another way of saying, hear the word of God and then sing in response. And so uh, I'm going to share from the scriptures and then we're going to come back and sing at the end of the service in response to what I've been talking about. Now I have a text, as always. And uh, to get your mind around this particular text from Philippians chapter 3, you need to uh, think of someone you know about who has accomplished great things in her life. And uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, some scholars believe, had the equivalent of, of two PhDs. Uh, and he was at, at the top of his game as a good Jew. Now, he happened to live in a culture that prized righteousness. And so, uh, in a way, you might say Paul would be the, well, not quite uh, a Steve Jobs of his time, but someone like that, and, and a period where people thought highly of those who excelled in righteousness, Paul was one of the best, one of the greatest. And with that in mind, uh, hear this, uh, this statement that Paul makes about his past uh, in the light of his present and his future. It's from Philippians chapter 3. Uh, verses 7 to 14. Uh, he says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may know Christ and have a righteousness that comes from him through faith and not from the law. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I just have to insert a comment here. What kind of person would be so compelling that one would say, I want to be like him in his death. Well, Paul felt that about the Lord Jesus. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now his future. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, all his pedigree, all his success. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And that is the word of God. Let's pray. So Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our heart be pleasing in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, Ernest Shackleton, maybe you've heard of him, he was an audacious explorer of the Antarctic and at the beginning of the 20th century he ran an ad in a London newspaper which read, men wanted for hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. Now you need to know a little bit about Shackleton to uh, properly appreciate what he was inviting men to do and the response he got. We'll get to that. Uh, just a little background. On one expedition in 1915 when his ship, the Endurance, was, was trapped in an ice floe in Antarctica, and about to break up under the pressure of the ice, uh, Shackleton had his crew abandon ship, get in lifeboats, and set out across open water in Antarctica. For five days, they braved savage weather and came to Elephant Island, which they discovered to be only a little bit more hospitable than the ice floe. 
Then Shackleton decided, well, they need to take another trip, and this time it would just be one boat, six men. He'd leave the rest of the crew on Elephant Island to try to survive until help was brought to the island. And so he got in this one boat, the best boat they had. They sealed it with uh, oil and with seal's blood, and he estimated it might take as long as a month, a month, in an open boat on the ocean in Antarctica. And so he only packed four weeks' worth of food knowing that if it took more than a month, they would all be dead. Well, they got to the next island, South Georgia Island, in just 15 days. They went through a hurricane that sank a 500-ton steamer. Uh, I think it was on this journey that Shackleton gave uh, the world this hair-raising anecdote. He, he thought one day the storm was breaking up, then maybe he saw daylight and he said, I called to the other men that the sky was clearing. Then a moment later I realized that what I had seen was not a rift in the clouds, but the white crest of an enormous wave. Now that's a lot of words. You, you, you see what he's saying? He said, I, I thought the sky was parting. I thought the storm was over. And instead what I saw was the foam on a, on a wave coming down on our little lifeboat. Okay, that's background. Why, why would anyone want to travel with someone like Shackleton? I mean, were there just a lot of bored, jaded, and deluded men in England at that time who could think of nothing better to do than to make low wages, live in bitter cold, and in constant danger? No way. I think they wanted to experience something that Shackleton said he experienced when he was out on these expeditions. And I'll have this quote up on the screen. Looking back on all that he had done with his crews, he said, we had seen God in his splendors. Heard the text that nature renders. We had reached the naked soul of man. That's what they signed up for. That's what they wanted. Think of it. The travel with Shackleton would be the hardest thing they had ever faced. But that was a small price to pay if it meant seeing something of the splendors of God. Of hearing the text that nature renders or reaching the naked soul of man. They went with Shackleton because they were glory seekers. And they wanted to travel with someone who could take them to that kind of glory. The last several weeks, I've been talking about a Greek verb that Jesus uses about entering the kingdom of God. He said, strive to enter through the narrow door. And that Greek verb that is translated strive in some translations is the Greek verb agon, or it's the root. Agon is the root of the verb, from which we get our word agonia. And Jesus says, go into the kingdom that way. And that way means uh, with agon. It's what an athlete does. Uh, when exerting herself. Uh, it's what a boxer does in a fight. It's what a wrestler does when faced with an opponent. Uh, it's going to take everything you have to go on this journey. Now no, Jesus didn't say it'll take everything you have to be allowed in, but when you're allowed in, if you're going to take this trip, if you're going to sign up for the kingdom, realize that it will take everything you have. He was speaking of the kingdom when he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus said that if you want to save your life, you need to lose it. And, and be like a farmer who discovers a treasure in a field, who spends everything to buy the field to get the treasure, or someone who's found a pearl of great price and just gives away his life savings to get it. I'll go. Being all in. If you remember what Alistair said to us last week, it will take everything you have. Uh, the martyr missionary Jim Elliot understood this perfectly when he wrote in his diary as a college student. He is no fool 
to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Well, the Apostle Paul, after suffering a beating that was so severe that he was left for dead, he told the churches of Iconium and Lystra and Antioch, we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Now, read from the hardship angle, that statement is a turnoff. Why go on a journey that will be hazardous and, and tough? But read from the perspective of the glories that the journey's in, it's just an altogether different matter. The high price is really a bargain when compared to what you get when you do it. Agone. Fierce abandon. Vigor. What an athlete does. What a fighter does. What a soldier does. And how could it be other ways? The kingdom is the most important thing there is. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote, if Christianity of his faults is of no importance, and if true is of infinite importance, the one thing it cannot be is moderately important. And so Paul's epitaph, and uh, I'll just go on record, I, I want this on my gravestone. When he got to the end of his life, he said, I have fought the good fight. The verb appears twice, once as a verb, once as a noun. I have agoned the good agone. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That was the Apostle Paul's magnificent obsession. And again, he got it from Jesus. It wasn't just about Paul. Uh, he took Jesus seriously. And so in that text that I quoted to you, let me go back to just part of it. Uh, the, the, the road of the spiritual life is strenuous. It's hard. And so he says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that verb press on is, is, is used usually in, in, in the sense of a, of a hunter uh, pursuing a quarry, a runner running for the gold medal. That's how I'm pressing in. To take hold. It's a wrestling term. The Greek is literally I grasp in as much as I was grasped by Christ. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, now, now picture this. Paul, and, and he probably got this in ways it's hard for us to get, but, but he was on the road to Damascus to, to arrest Christians, maybe have them executed, and he met Jesus on the road, and Jesus threw him down and pinned him. He took hold of him. He grabbed him. Uh, I have friends who sign their letters to me uh, with the appellation at the end, uh, in his grip. Uh, they're probably thinking about Paul. Paul says, I was, I was going in the opposite direction and, and Jesus grabbed me and he pinned me. And then notice how Paul describes his life. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Just as Jesus pinned me, so I will pin any obstacle to knowing him. That's being all in. And the point of this strictness is not strictness in and of itself. It's the prize. You know, I want to talk about the prize and see if I can make it um, come alive to you. But I just got to say, sometimes people, you know, hear about, you know, the Christian hope of heaven, the Christian hope of reward, and, and they think, well, that's just too good to be true. It's kind of pie in the sky by and by. I, I, don't, I don't respond to it that way. I just think it's so big that it's hard to grasp. And I'm going to try to give you a picture of what the prize is like. But I just got to say in the beginning that, that when, when, when the Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, has not entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them who love him, I just got to say, whatever I tell you about it, it'll be better. Okay? But work with me. What will the prize be? Well, just two things this morning. The prize will be God's applause. I mean, whatever else the crown of righteousness that Paul says he's going for may be, the one thing that stands out is the one who bestows it. The Lord, the righteous judge. In other words, the great prize for which we have lived and longed our whole lives will be in some way, 
And again, I don't know exactly what that crown is, but I know this much, God's going to give it to me. And that strikes a deep chord in my soul. The sweetest words I will ever hear will be God's well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's celebrate together. So St. Augustine was thinking about this when he said, You made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they repose in thee. Bernard of Clairvaux said it another way. He said, From the best bliss that life imparts, our hearts turn unfilled to you again. There's a God-shaped vacuum, said Pascal, in our hearts. Every human desire points ultimately to the heart's deepest desire. G.K. Chesterton said, The man knocking on the door of a brothel and the man at the communion table are looking for the same thing. They're just... One of them's looking in the wrong place. But the point is, we want to be satisfied. And our greatest satisfaction will be to have the one we were made to satisfy say, yeah, you did it. Now, I love to tell this story because it just illustrates the point so well. But again, I, I'm falling short of what the Bible says. It's just too big to grasp. But one day when, uh, when Joel and the kids were really small, I was uh, cleaning house and I uh, was in the living room uh, dusting and vacuuming and uh, playing some music. And uh, I, I don't go to dances. The president's ball is always a terror for me because, uh, well, I can't dance for one thing and then I, and I sweat a lot when I try. And so it's just kind of, it's kind of ugly. But I was alone and the music was playing in the living room and I was starting to dance to the music as I dusted and uh, vacuumed and picked things up. And, uh, and I really kind of, I kind of was rocking out. I was really dancing. Uh, grotesquely, but, it, but I was, no one was watching, I thought. And I was just running around the living room just having a great time. You know, a 40-something old man just dancing to his heart's content. And you know, have you ever done something that you, you knew looked pretty silly, but you thought, well, no one is watching, but then after a while you just feel eyes from someplace, you know? Well, this particular day I could feel some eyes, and I looked around, and behind the sofa was Joel. He's about three years old. And you know, he had no standards at this point, and he thought what I was doing was really, really good. And he came out, and he thought Dad was really silly, and thought that was fun, and so... I invited him to dance with me. And we started dancing. We started running around the living room. Uh, Joel started doing things I would normally spank him for by jumping up and down on tables and couches and stuff like that. And pretty soon I got tired and I had to sit down, but he was running around and I started doing this. And he could have gone on the rest of the day if you could have seen the look. And this, this, these are kids. Kids do this because, well, we're all that way. The, the unabashed joy and pleasing <laughs> the one we were made to please. So Paul says, now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And whatever that crown is, the best part of it is who gives it. Yes, I've suffered, I've run, I've been beaten, but I am after the prize, and the prize will be God's big smile Listen, this will set you free. Most of us are people pleasers. And you know what a slavery that is. To want to always be pleasing somebody else. If you let this get in your bones, if you ask God by his Holy Spirit to give you a longing to please the only one, you should please. It will free you from the rest of us. And our approval, our disapproval. Yeah, you know, I, I, guys, I, I'm sorry. If you like the show, forgive me. I hate American Idol. I just hate it. I'll tell you why I hate it. First of all, the title is just terrible. And how do you become an American Idol? Well, it really works if you're like Susan Boyle from Scotland. A nobody. No one's ever heard of her. She sings well enough to, to win the prize and she gets a lot of record contracts and everybody is, and everybody, millions are on their feet applauding. What a lie. Listen, you guys. All the applause of all the people in the world do not add up to God's. And the day will come. It will come. When the most important, we'll, we'll finally get it. It, it. The most important thing in life will be, is this one.
pleased. And you guys can walk up to me and say, you know, that was really a dumb sermon, Ben. And you're kind of stupid. And I, well, I might dispute your uh, judgment. Uh, I'll just say, well, that'll hurt. But I do know this that your opinions, all of your opinions, all the world's opinions do not add up to God's. So yeah, Paul puts up with a lot and you will, you may, you probably will put up with a lot if you follow Jesus Christ. If you run that race. You will suffer for it. What makes it worth it? The prize. The one you were made to please will be pleased. Hmm. American Idol. We have a lot of those. Secondly, this prize. Uh, Jesus says it will be to shine like the sun. Matthew 13, 43. The righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Now what can that mean? Okay, you've got to work with me on this. I'm in over my depth. I'm going to try to describe something I've only had glimpses of, but just, just kind of go with me. See if this works for you. And this is not, I, I just quoted the scripture. The scripture is absolutely true. You will shine like the sun in your Father's kingdom. That is the prize. What does that mean? Well, this is my attempt to describe what it means. Maybe it means that this brightness that will be given to us will be bright in a way that makes our current brightness look like a little match. I mean, will the brightness of our humanity one day be so brilliant that we'd have to squint our eyes if we were to see it now? That, that to be in the image of God is, is to show something of God's greatness. But what, would, what if, if the one, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory? What if, now again, I'm trying on this, but just try to get your, get your imaginations working on this. What if you could get a glimpse of yourself as you will one day be? And you discover, you discover that you're like the sun compared to what you are now. 1 John 3, uh, brothers and sisters, now we are God's children, but it has not yet appeared what we shall be. But we know that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I, I think this is going to be physical. I think, I agree with C.S. Lewis, that the person you're sitting next to right now, if you were to see them as they're going to be, in the radiance of God's glory, you know, Thank you for who you're around. Lewis said you would be strongly tempted to worship them. Well, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love them. But Jesus says, in that day, the righteous will shine like the sun. Now that's one take on it. Let me give you another take. The sun dominates our solar system. Now, it provides the gravitational center of all the planets. All the planets reflect its life and its light, and all living things draw life from it. Does Jesus mean that our glorification will be to the created order what the sun is to the solar system? Will our freedom mean the universe's freedom? Are Paul's words in Romans 8 another way of depicting the same thing? And I'm reading from Philip's paraphrase here. The whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. And the hope is that in the end, the whole of created life will be rescued from the tyranny of change and decay and have its share in that magnificent liberty which can only belong to the children of God. Will we discover, I think the scripture tells us this, will we discover that when we are finally set right, everything else will be set right too? Again, stay with me. 
Well, we discover that the words of the prophets were more than just metaphors. Now think of what Isaiah said. Well, babies put their hands in cobra dens and not be harmed. Maybe get a little high from the cobra. I don't know. Well, lions and lambs really lie down together and the lambs sleep well. I mean, the prophet says that, but... Is it, but I mean, whatever this, is, whatever this prize is, whatever this goal to which history is moving for those in Christ, I wonder, will we discover it wasn't metaphor at all? It's literally true. Well, we discover that the Dr. Doolittle stories were myth instead of fantasy, that one day our freedom will mean animals can talk human. Our humans can talk animal. Will the trees really clap their hands for joy? Will we hear the music of the spheres? Will the highest mountains and the ocean depths and the deepest forests become home to us? Will the farthest reaches of the universe be ours to touch and explore? Well, the possibilities are dazzling. And let me offer you another picture of how this all comes together. One of my greatest privileges as a pastor is when I serve communion to people. And I love to look in their faces. I've looked in your faces many times. This is too grand to grasp. It really is. But to hand you or anyone a piece of bread and say, this is the body of Christ. And then to offer you the cup saying, this is the blood of Christ. What's being said is that Jesus wants to to be in you and live in you and become part of your molecular structure. That all that he is, all his radiance, all his beauty, all his glory wants to be in you. I mean, it's not communion. Which we can never celebrate too many times. Another way of saying, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And God will say, there they are my sons and my daughters, and I am totally pleased with them. You know, I think God's chief complaint with us is that we're satisfied with such little things. I mean, frankly, Shacklin's kind of a tragic, tragic figure to me. I think, you know, well, he kind of had a lifetime of extreme sports, and he talked about seeing, you know, the splendors of God. Well, I don't, I kind of wonder about that, but I do believe this. That if we were to set our desires next to what the New Testament says our purpose in life is all about, we would discover that our desires are too small. As C.S. Lewis put it, we are fooling around with sex and drink and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. We're like children uh, playing with mud pies in the slums because we can't imagine what is meant by the offer of the holiday at the sea. We are just far too easily pleased and we're too easily discouraged. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, he said, we're like... We're like people who are on their way to inherit an estate. He said it was in New York. And on the way to, oh, let's just put, we're out there, you're going to inherit all the property on the West Coast. And you're on your way to pick up your inheritance. And on the way, the car breaks down and you have to walk the last couple of miles. Newton said all the way, you're saying, oh, my car broke down, my car broke down, my car broke down. There's no place to be discouraged. Some of you guys are under tremendous pressure right now, academically. You're really tired. You're really worn out. And you're saying, Man, I'm worn out. I'm going to flunk. I'm just terribly oppressed. I'm depressed. I, I just can't handle all this stuff. It's just too much for me. And listen, you're on your way to receive glory. So don't say my car broke down. Say... This one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to win the goal for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You can believe that. Let's pray. So Lord, expand our imaginations, I guess, Certainly strengthen our faith and our hope. Give us greater love. But Lord, I pray we will run with perseverance the race set for us because we see 
a glimpse of the glory that we're running toward. Amen.